Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. I hope that you're doing well today. We are doing pretty good. We have uh, Brian back with us and Tom has joined us also. He's having some technical difficulties, but Brian is really the important one because, you know, he was gone for a period of time in a far off land, far, far away. Brian, did you have a good trip? We had an outstanding trip. Uh, had a great, uh, uh, just a lot of a lot of value. Got to meet with a lot of saints in Peru, and that was really uh, a very encouraging thing. That's really good. That is really good to hear. Um, we had Jerry Wilcox with us today. Jared Dart, Danell, Aline, and David as well. And we have you. We would like to thank you so much for joining us for our study today. We're going to be picking up in John chapter 6, verse 29, is where we'll be here in just a moment. All righty. Let's see, gentlemen. Let's go ahead and bring this up. Last week, we did talk some about verse 29. But what I would like to do, just for the context, um, so the, the backstory to this particular section the people were following Jesus, looking for him again, because the preceding day he had fed them. And so he acknowledges that this time around, they're seeking him because he says, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. So he tells them not to labor for the food which endures to everlasting life. Um, I'm sorry, I read that wrong, didn't I? Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man gives you. Now, he is about to build upon that here in a little bit farther down in the text, the idea of him being this food which endures to everlasting life. So they ask him there in verse number 28, and I'm just bringing this up real quick. Um, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? And then it is there in verse 29. He says, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent okay any final thoughts about verse 29 before we continue with this this conversation none okay so so they make the statement him so let's pick up there in verse number 30 and i'll read this down to verse number verse number 34 it's a very short segment here we'll look at, but it'll give us something now to talk about with this. So he says here in verse 30, therefore, they said to him, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. So let's talk about this for a few minutes, guys. Going back there to verse number, oh, verse 30 there. They're wanting to know what sign will he perform that they may see it and believe. Um, Tom, Tom, is this the first sign that he's ever done for them? <laughs> Not by a long shot. Uh, yeah. I, I assume you can hear me now. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I got things. I mean, not by a long shot. I mean, I mean, he's he's done multiple. I mean, John has gone out of his way to specifically number the fact that he's done signs, even though they were in Cana and so on. And uh, uh, even the day before, he just did. Yeah, a sign. yeah he had the five thousand, <laughs> which is what's bringing this up. And, and I do yeah. find it interesting that uh they they appeal to oh moses gave bread <laughs> you know M moses yeah. gave us bread so so i mean can't you do this yeah i mean uh, you did it yesterday uh you did it yesterday sure you surely you can do it for us again today uh, uh that kind of a thing and obviously what you're seeing here is you're seeing they're wanting the uh, trick pony or, or 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 whatever you describe it like i mean uh, th that's what that's what this at least this group that's what a lot of this group wants is they want the entertainment. Well, and the free foods you don't have to work yep. for. Yeah. Because that's what they got the day before. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm going to throw this one um, at, at Brian. So there in verse 31, 
so this is their reply to him. Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Okay. Now that's what Exodus says. Uses the term, he gave them bread from heaven. Now, going back to Exodus 16, I think it's Exodus 16. Any thoughts about that particular phrase, Exodus 16, verses 4 and verse 15? In other words, was it literally from heaven? Okay. Any thoughts? Uh, so it, what, it's a neat idea, right? Um, I always like uh, in Psalm 78, verse 24, God rained down manna on them and gave them the bread of heaven. Um, you know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse 3, Paul calls manna a spiritual food. So it, the connection here is not heaven as in the sky, of course. It's heaven as in directly from God. Manna is such an important idea in the Bible. Uh, Moses would later say in the book of Deuteronomy that the real value of manna was that God was trying to demonstrate to them that, they, that man doesn't live by bread alone, but he lives by the very word of God. So this idea about manna was that manna was, a, was an extremely spiritually significant idea. And I kind of wonder here about the idea, too, that whenever they're saying, what sign will you perform? You know, obviously, they have this problem with saying, hey, what sign are you going to do after he's just done sign and sign and sign? But, but in this case, um, because they went directly to the manna conversation, I've kind of wondered if maybe what they're really saying is, what kind of sign will you perform to demonstrate your the great prophet? In other words, Moses has promised back in Deuteronomy that there's going to be a prophet like me. Who's going to come? He's going to, you know, he's going to speak like me, meaning he's going to, uh, he's going to be a mediator of a covenant kind of thing. And I've wondered if perhaps that might be a little more of what they're asking. Since they went to manna and they said, you know, Moses's big thing was he gave us manna. What are you going to do? Um, and of course, Jesus, you know, doesn't give them the, you know, I've done many signs. You're an adulterous generation conversation that he gives elsewhere in the answer signs. He says, well, guess what, guys? Wait for it. I am the bread of heaven. You know, I am the the bread that comes down from heaven. I, you know, manna was actually a symbol of me, not, you know, not what I'm doing is a symbol of manna. So I've kind of wondered if maybe that's what's going on here, that they, that maybe in some way somebody grasped the idea that manna's the big thing. So Jesus, if you're really the, I'm going to use the term the second Moses, only to say that you're the uh, the follow, the person who's meant to follow Moses or to be the the one Moses predicted, then what will you do that was like Moses? Jesus says, well, I'll, I'll take Moses' miracle of manna and I'll do one better, one big better. I'll be the bread from heaven. So um, that's what I've kind of wondered about this passage. Okay. All right. Interesting point. Any other thoughts on it? It is right. interesting mm -hmm. to me that uh, I had to unmute there for... So that's regnant for the president, pregnant pause. It's interesting to me, they did not bring Moses into it. They just said, our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it was written, he gave, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And of course, we know that the, the writing was about what God did, not about what Moses did. Moses may have been on their minds. And of course, Jesus would know that. Uh, but there does seem to be the implication based on what Jesus said that they are thinking this is a sign that Moses gave. So now what sign are you going to give us? And uh, again, they're never satisfied with the signs that he uh, had done. They're always wanting another sign. And Jesus finally said, there's no sign be, will be given, but the sign of Jonah. I'll be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, just as Jonah was three nights, three days and three nights in the heart of the great fish. Uh, but uh, Jesus does point out, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, Im implying that was not Moses, that was God. Moses really had nothing to do with it uh, directly, uh, except maybe to tell the tell God, you know, they're hungry and we don't know what we're going to do. And, uh, but then he switches to the present. My father gives you the true bread from heaven. So there's the typical bread that was given in the wilderness during those 40 years. And then there's the true bread 
that was being given through Jesus at the at the then present time. Uh, and I, I like that when Jesus says, uh, I am the true vine in John 13, uh, meaning he's not the typical vine, but he's the reality of that typical vine. So now he's the reality of that typical, typical bread, the typical bread being a means of physical substance or susten sustenance, but it was uh, a type of the spiritual sustenance that God really wanted them to have and was now providing for them. Okay. Right. Good thoughts. Good thoughts. You know, what struck me as interesting, and I had to, I had to look at a couple other translations because I think I was headed down the wrong rabbit hole with this. But the, when you read from the New King James Version, and I'll bring it back up here, he says, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven. So is he saying Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven? Or is he saying Moses did not give you the bread from heaven? <laughs> In other words, it was it, it, from this reading, the question sounds like it is, is his point that the manna was not the true bread from heaven? Or as Bob's already talked about, the main point is, is that it wasn't Moses that gave it to you, but the Lord. The ESV makes it a little bit more direct that Moses, um, he's talking about that it was God, not Moses, that gave it to them. But I thought that's kind of interesting there. Yeah, I kind of lean toward that, Brian. I, 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 I kind of lean toward it's the idea of Jesus is correcting them. You know, it wasn't Moses, it's God, you know, you know, yeah. you know, or God is the one that did it. So. But, but you have the contrast here in the verse. But my father yeah. gives you the true bread from heaven. Yep. Suggesting that manna was not truly from heaven as the word comes from heaven, but that manna came from God. Okay. But in this case in point, the true bread does truly come from heaven. Not sure. Right. That, I'm not saying there is a contrast, but it sounds like it. Right. And, and, and in the same way, in the same way that, in the same way that God provided you physical bread, God can provide you, and he is providing you spiritual yeah. bread through me. And then 33, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. That doesn't define manna. Manna, God gave them manna, but manna didn't cut. I could be wrong about what I'm about to say, but I don't think manna literally came from heaven, but God caused, formed manna to be there for them. And manna only sustained them for one day. Then they had to collect it the next day, with the exception of on six, the sixth day, they had to collect enough for both days. And then, didn't that manna stop once they made it into the land of Canaan? Yeah. It was not intended to be exactly a That is exactly when it stopped. Yep. Yeah. Um, so in this case in point, the bread of God literally, if you want to say literally, comes from heaven through Jesus Christ. And it is a forever giving bread of life that does not end. Um, right. Yeah. And, and, and you know, how, con, considering the fact of how that manna happened, clearly it was miraculous. I mean, we, absolutely. We, we, we can't explain the process. And, and so and whether physically or uh, philosophically, I don't know whichever word you want to use, it did come from heaven. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I mean, even, even if God used natural means somehow to make it appear which i can't i can't envision even though he could i turning sand into bread <laughs> you know i mean <laughs> yeah. I, I i think it was just there e even though it's interesting it said in the heat of the day it melted i guess it melted and went into the ground and stuff like that and and and, and of course god really demonstrated himself with uh with the friday you, you know yeah. the fact that on friday you had to get it two days so, uh, so I mean, every and it would hold for two days. Yeah, yeah, it held for two days only on yeah. Friday. You know, yeah. you know, only when you collected it on Friday. I mean, I mean, there's some things in there where you just can't get around. You know, this is God working, and and if God can do that, and by the way, you all know that God could do that because that's what you're asking. Uh, he he can do what I'm offering you, which is even better. All right, um, before we start with their response and get into the next section, 
Let me take a moment to welcome Caleb Davis. He has joined us. Uh, Marcia Gray and uh, Gregor Hinkler has also dropped into the study. And listen, if this is your first time studying with us, we'd love to hear from you. Um, if you're viewing this on our Facebook page, uh, there is a comment area to this live video stream. Let us know uh, what your thoughts are in that comment section. Maybe say, you know, you're, you're, you're Bill from Louisiana. You know, just tell us who you are for a half second. And then if you have any thoughts, share them with us. If you own our, if you're on our YouTube channel, use the chat area there. And also be sure to like and subscribe and do the stuff that each platform tells you to do so that you will always know when we start our next study. So verse 34, after hearing this, the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said, Lord, give us this bread always. Paul, do you think, and Paul just jumped in, so this will be unfair of me. Do you think that they still are thinking literal cessation of hunger? Literal bread forever being given? It seems like, uh, and I didn't, I was not able to hear everything else that was being said while I was away, but it does seem like uh, even among Jesus's closest followers, they are hung up on seeing everything very literally even when yeah. Jesus is very plainly speaking in figurative terms. Yeah. And he's about to tell them I'm standing in front of you. <laughs> very bad yeah. paraphrase, but yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, John, uh, you know, <clears throat> when I look at them asking the question, give us this bread in verse 34, I guess what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Prior to this, Jesus had not said you will never hung hunger again. You know, I mean, when you look That's at what he said, verses 32 and 30, it's in verse 35 that he yeah. says you'll never hunger again. Uh, I mean, uh, and and uh, so, I mean, uh, they were just saying, you know, Jesus is just making the spiritual application. The, the bread, uh, you know, uh, it gives life to the world. Oh, we want that, you know, yeah. or, or another way of saying that we want that, too. <laughs> Or, or 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 maybe they're thinking that that's some kind of physical whatever you know uh whatever's involved in that but then give give us whatever the spread and then Jesus goes on and makes the the bread that I'm offering you you'll never hunger again which is an interesting statement by the way so it is interesting that he says the bread of God is he a person who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world that's him and yet they're not wanting him. Uh, they're wanting this, this bread again. And I think they are still thinking in terms of material sustenance, uh, uh, as, as being the, the, uh, the one and only or primary thing that they, that they needed. And they wanted this physical bread always. Uh, but the only way that, that, they could have the bread of the bread of God who comes down from heaven always is by uh, receiving Jesus and by receiving Jesus, of course, receiving the father and becoming disciples and eventually Christians and, and living a life for him. Yeah. Bob, let's go ahead and continue reading. If you would, for us read 35 down to verse 40. All right. And that'll, that'll get us into the next section here. All right. Again, New King James translation. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the son and believes in him may have everlasting life and I will raise him up at the last day. All righty. Thank you, Mr. Bob. So bringing us back then to verse 35, we've already talked some about this. He who comes to me shall never hunger. 
he who believes in me shall never thirst. Now, as Bob said, or who was it? Tom said that he didn't say that earlier. Okay. But now he's bringing this idea in of never hungering and never thirsting. Okay. He who comes to me shall never hunger. So give us this bread. He says, I'm, I'm right in front of you. I am the bread of life. Um, but verse 36, do we see a definite observation regarding their stubborn will, their stubbornness? They had not seen him for whom, for whom he was. Yeah. They saw the body. They saw the man, but they did not see the son of God. They did not see him as the bread of God. They did not see him as the one thing they needed for true spiritual sustenance. Yeah. And so they just missed out completely. It's like not being able to see the forest for the trees. That's a good point. Good point. Um, any thoughts or comments about that? Do we encounter the same thing today? Yes. Yeah. Quite frequently, sadly. Also, interestingly, he who comes to me is equivalent to uh, believing in me. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Coming to him and believing in him is equivalent to uh, entering into a right relationship uh, with him. And... Uh, all that the Father uh, gives me will come to me. Well, how does the Father give give us to Jesus? Well, through the Word. And so God doesn't give us against our will. He gives us yeah. in accordance with our will to Jesus. But in order for him to do that, we've got to accept the bread of life. And and eat the bread of life and and drink the water of life, etc. Uh, as he later says, eat his bread and uh, eat his uh, flesh and drink his uh, drink his blood. Uh, if we really want to be acceptable to God, that's a good point. That's yeah. a good point. And forty four and forty five will kind of expand on this too. Go ahead, Tom. You know, I, you know, something else that's interesting about this, uh, uh, the, he who comes to me shall never hunger. Uh, Matthew 5 and verse 6 in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, the, the, what we call the Beatitudes, uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. You know, there, there's one sense in which we are to hunger. Uh, we need to constantly hunger. And we're never going to be filled. We're never going to be filled as long as we are in this life. But yet, you contrast that with the point that he's making here. You know, with this bread, you will never hunger. And and uh, maybe the way to say that is, uh, uh, he who comes to me will never go hungry, as long as you stay with me. So I, I don't know if that's a good analogy of what we're dealing with here, but it's hmm. a thought. All right. Any thoughts about that? Oh, by the way, uh, uh, Brian brought up a point in the comment, if he wants to bring it up, in our personal comments. Oh, I missed that. I try not to pay attention to you guys, what you say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we usually say things like, we need a new host or something. That's our <laughs> danger. Yeah, I, I just I just asked uh, or brought up that uh, we have seven times in the book of John that Jesus makes particular I am statements. Mm -hmm. Um and we usually, when we kind of characterize these things, we begin here and we say, Jesus here says, I am the bread of life. In John chapter 8, he'll say, I am the light of the world. In John chapter 10, he will say, I am the door. And then uh, a few verses later, he'll say, I am the good shepherd. In chapter 11, he'll say, I am the resurrection and the life. In chapter 14, he'll say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Chapter 15, he will say, I am the vine. And sometimes we kind of characterize these as seven statements that Jesus makes. Uh, Jesus makes other I am statements too, by the way, uh, more generic. But we characterize these as being unique specifications of Jesus describing himself in a way uh, that, that 
that speaks to a particular work that he does or a particular aspect of who he is um, that really catches our um, interest or catches us to to pause for a moment and consider what he's trying to say. Just so you know that my short-term memory is not gone, I do remember mistakenly referring to John 13 instead of John 15 uh, a moment ago when I said Jesus said, I am the true vine. And so, yeah, that is John 15. I appreciate you bringing that up, not John 13, as I previously, as I previously said. Now, in Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they should be satisfied. They'll be satisfied with that. Well, that's the same thing that he's saying, uh, that he's saying here. Uh, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. Why? He'll be satisfied with me. He'll receive the sustenance from me that he really, that he really needs. And it doesn't mean that we can stop hungering once we uh, become uh, Christians, but we continue to be satisfied. And so we will never be really hungry again, unless and until sometime that we depart from the faith and come to ourselves and realize what we've done and, and become hungry again and come back to him uh, for, that, uh, for that sustenance. So, uh, John uh, 636 uh, or 635 is really saying the same thing to me as Matthew 5, 6. Oh, yeah. And, 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 I, and, I, and I agree with that. I was just pointing out the contrast the way this is written. You know, based on what you just said, I looked it up. The one thing I know about Greek, <laughs> other than a few words, is present tense. Yeah. <laughs> That, that, that's about the only thing I know about Greek from that standpoint. And the word he who comes is present tense. He who believes is present tense. And of course, present tense means it's something that you're doing now and it's ongoing. You're going to continue to do it as long as you're doing it. So Jesus is saying that, you know, he who continues to come to me is not going to hunger, which implies the same thing as the hungering and thirsting after righteousness being filled. So it's just an interesting observation, the never hunger and the we are to hunger. You know, and so. this might be a good time to point out that it seems to me that a lot of people base their salvation on the fact that they were baptized 30 years ago. Oh, I was baptized. Okay, yeah, but are you living for Jesus? Yeah, have you starved to death spiritually? Yeah, and so it's not a matter of what you did. 30 years ago, it's a matter of what are you doing now? Did you rise from the waters of baptism to live in a newness of life? And are you still living in that newness of life? Or have you gone back into that oldness of death? And and so I, I, I think it's, it's wise to keep in mind that present tense uh, is <clears throat> always present tense for the child of God. Uh, if, if, it's, if it's not present, it's in the past. If it's in the past, it's gone. And you need to be renewed or renew yourself. Okay. All right. Well, let's, let's make one more connection here real quick between 37 and 39. I'll bring this back up here. He says, all the Father gives me will come to me. Okay. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Then verse 39. This is the will of the Father uh, who sent me that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing. Do you think that's talking about the same object there? All that the Father gives me will come to me and that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing. In other words, it goes back to what you're talking about in effect. As long as we are continuing to believe in Jesus and follow him, we will be his and we will be raised up at the last day. There's that's verse right. 39. And and even yep. and even if we fall away, Jesus didn't lose us. We right. lost ourselves. Yeah, we came to Him and then we walked away from Him. Yeah, if, and so yeah, so it's back to that present tense. We've got to keep ourselves in Him if we want Him to keep us and raise us up at the last day. Yeah. Which brings in yeah. Revelation uh, uh, two mm -hmm. verse ten: "Be thou faithful unto death." 
and I, and you will receive the crown of life. There's an illustration I use often when I talk about in James 4, draw near unto God and he'll draw near unto you. And the way that visually I kind of see this is our Heavenly Father never changes position, if you would. Okay. Either we come to him or we walk away from him. It's not us standing fixed and he leaves us. It's whether or not we come to him and remain with him or we choose to walk away. It's like a parent in the store telling a child to stand by them. Well, if the parents, you know, if the child decides to wander off, the child, it's the child's fault. They're no longer by the parent. Now I know there's responsibility on part of the parent, but just follow the illustration. Um, but once the child realizes they've wandered from the parent, then they long to come back and they come back by their parent's side. Um, and so coming back to this, people coming to Jesus and then people choosing to walk away from him, um, it's got to be consistent. And there does seem to be a correlation here between I will by no means cast out in verse 37 yes. and should come up the last day in verse 39. Yeah. Those who are not cast out will be raised up. Uh, exactly. Those who are that will not be raised up, at least not to eternal life. They'll be raised up to condemnation. Yeah. Right. And then yeah, in verse I, 40, he refers to that again. Sorry, Tom, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, no, no, you're okay. I, I was going to tie to your grocery store illustration. You know, it's interesting <laughs> when, mom, when mom and dad says, stay by me, as mom and dad move along, the child yeah. is supposed to move along with them. So... Unless something catches his eye and he's amazed by it and stands there while they're walking. <laughs> but he's no longer walking with them. But aren't we like children to our Heavenly Father? You know, it's, you know, oftentimes I think about the relationship, the teachings about parents and children are um, represented between God and us. We are his children. And sometimes we act like children. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Paul, any thoughts? Any comments? No, I didn't have any. I've been filled with uh, distractions today from uh, oh, outside sorry. of the outside of our study. I've been trying to keep up, and I apologize for that for those who are following along. But um, everything I've heard, you guys are doing a good job, and I'll try to <laughs> stick with you for the last fifteen minutes, twenty minutes. Well, yeah. keep doing what you're doing. Just nod every now and then. Nod in agreement. Maybe get, get a quizzical look. You know, and then come back and nod in agreement. We'll be fine. <laughs> I can understand that. There was a couple of weeks back when they were still in the process of building the edition that I, I, I had to go, I had to walk away and leave y'all flying solo. <laughs> Which means nothing looks different. Y'all just like, like Hollywood squares. You're still beside everybody. Um, and so the last, or go ahead, go ahead, Bob. I just wanted to, you may have just wanted, wanted to bring up verse 40 now or yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but that's where I was going in my next comment. But if you want, we'll to go right ahead. No, 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 you're fine. Uh, well, I really think 37, 39 and 40 are parallel. This is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the son and believes in him. Well, that's what he said back in 35. Uh, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. You've got to come to him and believe in him. And then verse 37, uh, all that the father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. 39, this is the will of the father who sent me that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but raise it up to the last day. And now verse 40 he says pretty much the same thing in different words. This is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son of Man sees him in the sense of seeing him for whom he really is, not seeing his figure. It's not something limited to the first century during the time that Jesus was on the earth, uh, but who sees him with the eyes of faith and believes in him uh, may have everlasting life and I will raise him up the last day. And so anytime you see that raise him up the last day, the conditions are the same. They're just worded a little differently, looked at a little yeah. different. Yep. Yeah, that's a good point. 
Um, on a side note, Aline brought in a, a comment and we, we touched on the point, but not so much directly her comments. I think it'd probably be a good thing to discuss briefly. She says in verse 39, this is the will of the father sent me that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing but should raise it up at the last day. She says, has 639 been used to say once saved, always saved. And, and I'm quite certain that there would be those who would look at this particular verse here, um, to kind of make that point. You know, there's so many, so many statements of Jesus have been misused in teaching that once you're saved, you're always saved. But what that does, it destroys, among other things, it, it, it makes, uh, it misrepresents the, the word of God for sure, but it also destroys the free moral agency of man. Yeah. That man cannot be lost uh, of his own free will. And, yeah. and, that, and that is not the, the teaching of, of the Bible. Well, Hebrews right. 6, 4. Yeah. 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 Right. You know, I, and, and and in response to that, you know, from that standpoint, uh, I, I I believe I have seen this verse before used to make that justification because it is one of those statements. You know, all that he's given me, I'm going to lose nothing. But then again, I, I, I want to go back to, you know, in verse 40 that we talked about a few moments ago, this is the will that everyone who sees the Son and believes the Son, uh, care to guess what tense those words are in the verb? They're present tense verbs. So it's it's tied it's tied to our continuing to walk with Him. So I, I mean, the context answers it would just with just a little bit of just a little bit of background understanding. The context answers it. Yeah. Yeah. Which I want to go ahead and bring in Marsha's comment real quick. Marsha Gray. She says, if we want continual cleansing through Jesus Christ, we must stay in the word and live the life. And that's probably a reference to John chapter one, the verse nine, eight, and nine, somewhere in there, the area there. Yeah. Um, first John one. Yeah. yeah uh, okay. Seven or seven. Verse nine verse seven. is if we confess our sins. Okay, so the, this, I want to stress something here with this. And, and I like the connection. She uses the phrase continual cleansing, okay? And, and years ago, what, maybe 20 years ago, plus give or take, that was kind of a, a big discussion in the way that was being argued in the brotherhood. But her last part, we must stay in the word and live the life. I think that idea there is something you cannot, if, if you want to have the cleansing power of the blood of Christ, John says, my little children, I write these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the father. Well, the idea is if we're living according to the word and we stumble, what are we going to do? We're going to repent. Okay. If we abide by his word, as he's taught us to, we, we know when we fall, then we know what we need to do. We turn and ask him to forgive us and we get back on the path there. And as long as we are willing to come back to the Lord, the blood of Jesus Christ forgives us of our sins. When we get obstinate, when we get to that point that we walk away and we go on sinning, I think as the ESV version renders in, in 1 John, if we go on sinning, then there is no forgiveness of our sins. While we're in that state, we must come back to him, to where he was. Any thoughts about that? It sounds a lot like what he says also in uh, in when he's talking about I am the vine that we have to abide in him yeah in order that we can uh, be alive so and his word abides in us and we abide in him yeah I think we have to make a distinction between two words continual and mm -hmm. continual according Continuous. to okay. one dictionary continual is used to describe a process that starts and stops repeatedly. While okay. continuous is used to describe a process that continues for a long time without interruption. Oh, good distinction. Continual cleansing is correct. Else, the, the only alternative, it seems to me, to continual uh, cleansing, uh, well, continuous is, is an alternative, I guess, but either God continues to cleanse you or you're, or you're without sin. 
even in First John 1, 7, if we uh, walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with him and his son, and his blood cleanses us from all sin. Well, if walking in the light means never sinning, from what sin does the walking in the bread of light, does the blood cleanse us? And so I, th I think brethren are confused in th thinking that if you say continual cleansing, or even if you say continuous cleansing, uh, you're saying once you're saved, you're always saved. And I don't, I don't think that's right. Continual yeah. cleansing has conditions. When you realize that you have sinned, you need to make that right. And uh, some people seem to think that if you've sinned, even ignorantly, and you never know it, then you're going to hell. Uh, I, I, I have a hard time with that. Uh, if that's true, then the believer is in no better position than the unbeliever because he could always, he could die at any time without having confessed the last sin that he committed. And, that opens uh, up a whole nother discussion. A good one too. I mean, like for instance, if you, if you think, if you're a mature Christian, can you be guilty of an ignorant sin or sin of ignorance? Well, certainly the longer you study God's word, the more, the less ignorant you're going to be of his will. Right. And uh, the more in harmony with his will, you are going to live. And so, but can't, Go ahead. But can so, can we but can we ask the Lord to forgive us of our sin as 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 in as in the prayer that Jesus used as an example teach him how to pray when we go to sleep at night and if I don't you know, if I say Lord please forgive me of my sins will he forgive the sins that I maybe have done in ignorant ignorance or do I have to recall every single sin and I've heard some kind of hold this position. You have to recall every single sin in order for God to forgive you. And he will make a way for you to recall every single sin that you've forgiven, that you've committed. It I think like that maybe David makes a difference between high handed sin and sins. And, and, uh, I don't know if he says sins of ignorance, but, uh, sins of which I am unaware. Uh, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. No, I was actually going to bring up the exact point that uh, Dad was going to bring up David, too. I was going to say that when David says to not remember the sins of my youth, David seems to be stipulating to sins that he has no recollection of. He has no specific knowledge of, but it's more a generic, abstract uh, understanding that, he, you know, a, a probability of transgression. And, um, you know, so that's an inspired prayer. It would seem to be it's, it's probably meant to be an example for us. So I, I would agree with Bob on that. And, and on many good, things, Bob, but uh, <laughs> but on that, good, uh, that point. It's a good thing God doesn't require confession of every sin for the unbeliever. Because uh, what person can remember every sin he created or committed prior to becoming a Christian? Uh, especially if he's lived a life of debauchery. Well, I guess he can know he lived a life of debauchery. Uh, but he couldn't remember every specific sin he lived during that time. And uh, so confession of sins was not a part of the uh, plan of salvation for alien sinners, but it is a part of the uh, plan of salvation for children of God, forgiveness. It's a condition. But again, confess means to acknowledge, yep. and you can't acknowledge something of which you were unaware. Yeah. It almost You're creates right. two levels. You confess, Lord, I, I have sinned today, or I specifically swore at that person, and I'm sorry yeah. I did that. You know, please forgive me. And, um, and then there, since you know, we all should be conscious of the fact that as long as I am ignorant of something, I may be ignorant of a sin that I've committed. Yeah, I just that I is, struggle with that, and, I, and I'm not. Uh, Sorry, sorry, Bob. Now, then we're growing in God's word, yeah. and and uh, and so the more we grow, the more we realize something that is a part of my life should not be. Yeah, and I believe God does give us time to grow, mm -hmm. and uh, 
but we need to take full advantage of the time that he providentially gives us. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk about something real quick. We're almost out of time, but I want to bring in a couple comments real quick. I guess that what, what's always struggled, what where, and I'm not even sure if I'm making myself clear. I may sound like I'm supporting something completely unscriptural and I don't intend to. But it, it, is the, it is the struggle. Basically, when we fall asleep at the wheel, that's when we begin to encounter problems, okay, when we're not paying attention. That's when we slip up. That's when we'll say something we shouldn't say, or we will think something about someone we shouldn't think. And if we, if we fall asleep long enough, we may find ourselves in that state, okay, going on sinning and just kind of assuming in the back of mind everything is fine with the Lord. It's not so much a matter of specific details. Um, having to remember every little sin that Bible that the Bible says is wrong, which there's a lot of things. But I think when we boil it down to very simplicity, think about Galatians, Colossians chapter three, and the whole control of ourself. When we are paying attention, we are better suited to overcome the temptations and to be aware. When maybe we've not done something that is sinful, but maybe what we did was not wise, you know. Maybe, maybe, maybe it, it's not technically wrong, but I did hurt someone's feelings or, or something like that. You know, be always aware. A um, couple quick comments here. I'm, I'm going to bring in David Clark's last only because uh, what Greg, Greg are commented on is kind of on this thread. Uh, let's see. Greg, Gregory says, walking in the light indicates an action to remain in the light. Forgiveness requires repentance which I must strive to do. And so if I've stepped out of that light and I've engaged in sin, I have to step back into that light. And repentance does that. A blind man cannot walk in light only because he must know where the light is to walk in it. When we're blind to the word, we don't follow the word. And Caleb says, show your faith by your works. Um, and that's, that's a very good point. Um, David, I want to bring his in now. Can we bring more people to God if so many people are confused about the Bible? And therein lies the challenge. We have to do our part to, be, to try to teach them more accurately the Word of God in hopes that they will then find the proper path to the Lord. Um, oh, Caleb, real quick. Pay attention. Oh, there we go. Pay attention to the way you live and try to follow God's law the best you can and lean on the righteous judgment of God. It's a good way of putting that. And, Any thoughts? And his, Any comments? Mm -hmm. Even yeah. of us can say that we fully understand God's will in every regard. Yeah. We're always growing, always learning. We can collectively say that, much less individually. Yeah. Right. That's right. Right. You know, uh, in, in a little bit of response to David's comment mm -hmm. uh, or question, question there, uh, the truth to that is, if you can get somebody to respect the fact that the Bible is the Word of God and that we can understand it, if they're willing to sit down and study, yes, we can. Yeah. That uh, Typically, when that argument is used, and I'm not saying it's not an honest argument. You know, I, I believe there are some that genuinely believe it, but I believe there are people that are frustrated and believe that they're, they're convinced that we can't understand it just because there is so much religious division um, amongst us. But, but, but the truth is, is if we sit down and study God's word, uh, honestly, we can come to, uh, we can come to a con consensus. And, and that's exactly what Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians 1 and in verse 10 and so many other places, you know, speak, let, all speak the same thing, and so, uh, so I mean, uh, I un I understand the where the point's coming from, but it certainly can be answered. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the reason why Paul dropped off is he was expecting a visitor, and so he said if if the visitor showed up, he would he would need to bow out. Right. Okay. Um, well, a lot I more have, we uh, could say about that. <laughs> so, yeah, right, but, right, right. Getting back to the text. I, yeah. I, I have a closing comment on verse 41 because I think that wraps up this section, you know, which we've been talking about. I don't know if you've got well, more to say about all of this. Why don't you read it real quick? Because I had to stop okay. short of that. Oh, oh, did you stop at verse 40? Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, verse 41, after Jesus makes this point, 
everyone who sees the son and believes has everlasting life. Verse 41, the Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And, and, and that kind of ties this and then it goes, it goes a little bit of a different direction. Jesus deals with it more. But the point is everything that Jesus had said, everything that Jesus had offered to these people, what did the Pharisees hone in on? You know, what did the religious leaders hone in on? You said you came down from heaven. Yeah. You're claiming to be God. And, and I mean, you see the tunnel vision. I, I mean, it's clearly obvious, you know, uh, it didn't matter what Jesus said. They were honed in on finding something to criticize him about. And that's what they picked up on in spite of everything else he thought there. The hope that he gave to people. Oh, you said you came down from heaven. Well, let's let's you know, plan next week to pick up with verse forty-one, and that'll that'll get us into that context more solidly. Bob, go ahead though, real quick. No, uh, since you're going to hold that over, I'll I'll wait till next. Well, don't forget, you look like you're over fifty, so don't forget what you were going to say. Well, let me go ahead and say things. So it'll be uh, on record. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Never mind, it's gone. Train has left the station. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> All righty. Well, you have hopefully, almost seven days to remember it. Yeah, that's right. Well, hopefully you won't forget about us like Bob just lost his thought. Let's plan next Thursday to continue our study here. We'll pick up in verse 41. Tom's done a good job of introducing, um, introducing it here. But we'll continue and see how they abused what he said, how they try to use this against him and see what else verse chapter six brings to light as we go through the study. All righty. That's next Thursday, 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time here on our Facebook page, which is Truth Factor Live. Also, our YouTube channel, Truth Factor Live. And you can also go to our website, simply truthfactor.com. If you have any thoughts or comments you'd like to share with us separate from the study here today, you can send them to questions at truthfactorlive.com or email us individually, as you see on the screen there, john at paul at etc. truthfactor.com. And if we hear from you and it pertains to our study, we'll try our best to bring it into our next study. If it's something that needs to be more personal as far as, you know, written and directed directly written, well whatever i'm saying we'll write you back <laughs> if possible and and address your thought as well all righty appreciate it guys and appreciate you we'll see you back here again next thursday at 11 o'clock a.m central time y'all have a wonderful week <laughs>